Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Douglas. I'm the Business and Communications Director at Euroelectric. Welcome to Digitopia, where electricity meets data. Firstly, a big thank you to our supporters, Microsoft, Accenture, and Enlit, and a bit of housekeeping. We encourage you to ask any questions to the speakers using the chat function on the screen below. And in the later sessions, we'll be using interactive polling. To take part, you'll need to use menti.com. So open in your browser, M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter the code that you see on the web page. Please do that before the session start. Please also join us on social media using at, at your electric and the hashtags Digitopia and It's Electric. Now, the electricity sector has access to the second largest amount of data of any industry, second only to the media sector. This is due to the rare combination of having both customers and assets. This cre creates huge opportunities for the power utilities, but also some interesting privacy, security, and ethical concerns. Today, we'll be discussing these challenges and opportunities. We will also explore the interconnected exponential technologies such as artificial intelligence, digital communications, high-speed internet, blockchain, and computing memory. Today, we're also launching our brand new AI Insights paper, which examines the critical role these technologies will play in the clean energy transition and the unprecedented disruption for the power sector. And the main messages in the paper are number one, AI offers huge opportunities for the clean energy transition. Number two, AI needs the right incentives and room to develop its full potential. And third, regulation must protect consumer privacy, ethics, and establish trust. The full report and all case studies can be downloaded on the Digitopia webpage. Now, this afternoon, we have an excellent lineup for you with some of the world's leading experts in the field. The other sessions you have to look forward to this afternoon at 2.45, corporate sourcing of renewable electricity, at 4 o'clock, public awareness and customer empowerment, and at 5.15, data access, quality, and interoperability. Those times are all Central European times. But before that happens, we will first see a keynote presentation from the serial entrepreneur, author, and visionary, Peter Hinson. He will present how companies must learn to navigate uncertainty and adapt to the increasingly fast-paced environment. I've always liked his work, and I'm really looking forward to this. Over to you, Peter Hinson. Thank you, and delighted to be here and to talk about my favorite subject, which is the never normal. It's a play on words on a book that I wrote exactly 10 years ago called The New Normal, about what happens when digital stops being special and actually becomes normal. And that's pretty much the transition that we've had in the last decade. A perfect illustration of that was this wonderful image of the last presidential elections in the US in 2016, when everybody wanted to take a selfie with Hillary Clinton. But in 2020, digital was the only option, and the Democratic Convention was a digital-only event. We're now in a world where we're comfortable with the fact that digital is normal. We're constantly connected. We're never offline, and thank God we had that in the very scary pandemic episode that we just witnessed. Something that seemed far away and distant became very close to everyone's lives, and it reminded me of one of my favorite sci-fi movies of the last century, The Day the Earth Stood Still. What we experienced was not the day, it wasn't the week, it wasn't the quarter. 2020 is the year that the Earth stood still. We saw scenes that we never imagined we would ever see in our lifetime. And it was a global thing. And you probably traveled a lot, like myself, and this came to an absolute grinding halt. But thank God, during that episode, we had the fact that digital was normal. As a matter of fact, I think what we experienced in some ways was the 2020 great digital stress test. We had to figure out if we could still survive in a world where digital was our only option as an individual, as a family, as an organization. I have no idea how you experienced lockdown, 
But in our house, with two teenage kids, it was very simple. My appreciation as a father was completely correlated to the quality of the Wi-Fi signal in our house. If the Wi-Fi was good, I was okay as a father. And if there was a tiny interruption, just a millisecond hiccup in their YouTube or TikTok stream, they openly questioned the fact if I ever got a degree in computer science. And it wasn't just lockdown. In almost every single exit scenario, we have seen that technology plays an ever-increasing role. Innovation, digital. This is one of my favorite examples. This is the robot dog in South Korea patrolling a park to see if people are actually respecting social distancing or not. Who could have imagined something like this just a few months ago? Digital has truly become the new normal in every part of society, and actually we passed the great 2020 digital stress test. So what's next? For a brief period, digital, which used to be the cherry on the cake, became the cake. And now people are saying, well, what's going to happen after this actually pans out in the great BCAC before Corona, after Corona changeover? When are we going back to normal? Well, maybe not so soon. And maybe the normal we're going back to isn't the normal that we actually know from the past. Maybe the old normal doesn't exist anymore. And I find that fascinating because we're now entering a world where there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen, but maybe this is exactly the set of opportunities that we need to really transform our lives, our organizations, and our companies. I'm a big fan of disruption. I think disruption is actually a good thing. But the last 10 years, I talk primarily about digital disruption. But maybe digital was just the warm-up act. Maybe it was just the beginning. Maybe we have to brace for what I call a series of seismic shocks that are going to affect society and business. And of course, some of them will still be technological in nature. If you recall, it took us 10 years for digital to become normal, but a lot of the technological revolutions just around the corner are probably going to have as much or even more impact. Things like augmented and virtual reality, the real power of analytics and big data. Once we start to turn that information into intelligence with machine learning and massive automation, I actually believe it's a powerful cocktail that together is going to accelerate the pace of technological innovations. It's not just technological seismic shocks. We're in the middle of a biological one that probably isn't over yet. I mean, we have vaccines on the horizon, but before that really pans out, it's going to take some time. But go back before COVID, our biggest concern was the environment. How are we going to think about the future of our planet and think about ecological seismic shocks? This is a scene from Blade Runner 2049, one of my favorite sci-fi movies. Look at the orange sky, but this is the sky over San Francisco not too long ago. Many of my friends who live there sent me pictures like this. If you look at that, there was, I think, during COVID, a very interesting period where we saw that China when they closed down Wuhan, all of a sudden we saw pollution actually clearing up over China. And I believe that it's no coincidence that now we see that China is saying that it's going to cut its net carbon emissions to zero by 2060. We live in a world where there was a lot of discontent, discontent about the environment. We saw the gilets jaunes, but we're probably going to experience a lot of these social seismic shocks as well. And to round it up, I mean, look at the tensions that we saw growing globally between the US and China, geopolitical seismic shocks, what was a trade war turned into a full-blown technology war. One thing is clear, the world is now polarizing. We have a technology stack in the West, and there's another technology stack in the East that is maybe even more disruptive than anything I've ever seen. But the world isn't calm, the world is in disorder. And in some way, I think what we experienced is that this COVID pandemic was something that halted us all, that shocked us all. We saw businesses that had to close down. Our lives were affected, but the bigger picture is more than this pandemic. We live in a world that we need to take care of. We live in a world where we need fundamental changes to really think about how to really make this 21st century something that we want to absolutely see achieved. The problem is we don't know. The problem is we have no idea what the future is going to be, and we can be anxious about it, but at the same time, it's, for me, a set of opportunities. I think every single one of these seismic shocks are going to trigger things. They're going to trigger systemic shifts, and these are opportunities. Look at, for example, consumer behavior. 
Consumer behavior was already greatly altered because of digital. We now know so much about the user, the consumer. We can trace and follow and predict much more than we ever did in the past. But actually, COVID only accelerated that because we started to shop more online. A lot more of that data was now available. So consumer behavior is a great example of something that fundamentally shifts as a result of these changes. But it's not just consumers. The way we make money, the operating model and business model is more volatile than ever before. The result of that is, you know, for example, capacity and resources. How many people do we need to do that is going to shift. Financial performance is going to be greatly affected. I still feel sorry for everyone who put so much effort into the 2020 budget in November of 2019. And by the middle of March of 2020, we just throw it into the wastebasket. Every single one of these shocks is going to create shifts. And that is the opportunity for disruption, but the opportunity for change. And in my opinion, the real disruption still has to happen. The last decade was about digital becoming normal, but the next decade is where we're going to see disruption in food, agriculture, healthcare, and energy. And I believe that is enormously exciting. But one thing is clear, thinking we're going to go back to the old normal and the calmness of the past is an illusion. We're entering a world with more volatility than ever before, and that's exactly what I call the never normal. The never normal has a couple of characteristics, and I think it's important that we understand that. The first is we're in a world which is more fluid than ever before, and the pandemic has shown that. Look at work. I mean, all of a sudden we had to work from home and we coped. When we went back to the office, it wasn't the same office. And let's be honest, remote working wasn't easy. I love this Fisher-Price work-from-home playset, including video conference material, crying babies, and wine bottles. And we're now seeing that some companies are saying, why go back to the office? I mean, Facebook says, well, maybe half of the staff shouldn't go back to the office at all. Twitter even said, no employee should ever be forced to go back to the office. Fluidity in work, fluidity in society. We live in a bubble economy. And for some people, it was a great time to get braces. But for most of us, it was pretty challenging, especially for the younger generation. Not easy. Look at the Berliner Philharmonic. How can you make a profit with this type of a setup? But then you see the resilience and the creativity. This is a Dutch solution that went around the world where restaurant owners would put greenhouses in front of their restaurants for people to enjoy a corona-proof meal. This fluidity shows that it might be an illusion to hope to go back to the old normal. Everything will snap back to what we are used to. Maybe it's an opportunity to really use that as a step change to lock on to the new normal. Because I think this capability of change is going to be what companies really need to find. But super fluidity. The second is that nobody seems to be staying in their lane anymore. Businesses get very creative, and it means that they're actually looking outside of their normal swimming lanes. Look at January, which seems like a long time ago. But in January, at the Consumer Electronics Show, we had Sony introducing us to a vision of a new car. This is Sony, a company that makes TVs that was building a car. And at the same time, we had Toyota, a car manufacturer, that was introducing us to the concept of the woven city, a city where cars don't even function anymore. How crazy is that? You have a TV maker making cars. You have a car company thinking about a future without cars. Nobody stays in their lane. Look at technology. Amazon is the biggest cloud provider. It's not just an e-commerce retailer. It's bigger than Microsoft and many other players out there. And what you see is that in this world, we have to become extremely creative. Maybe my favorite example of that is Ping Ang, the largest insurance company in China. One of the largest banks in the world is reinventing itself as a healthcare platform player in China. This is the Ping Ang Good Doctor, where on the right, you can enter the booth and get an AI-powered diagnostic. And when you have your diagnostic, you can go outside and use the vending machine on the left to take the medication for your diagnosis. Imagine that, an insurance company leaving its swimming lane, becoming a healthcare player. The last characteristic is we're in a world which is hyper-connected. I mean, we now have more information than ever before. It's not just that digital is normal, everything is connected, and we see the heat of information actually radiating in this network age. And the result of that is that 
things are moving faster than ever before. There is a speed that is unparalleled. And of course, this was something that we saw very clearly during the pandemic. We had winners and losers. We had the best of times. We had the worst of times. This is probably one of the craziest graphs I've seen during the pandemic. This is the market value of Zoom, which we love or hate, $48 billion. But compared to the combined market cap of seven of the largest airlines in the world, and it's crazy to see that, that Zoom was worth more than seven of the largest airlines. And the reason is very simple. We stopped flying. This is flying patterns over Europe, March of 2019 and March of 2020. And if we stop flying, then we see the ripple effect. Because we stop flying, then the airlines need less planes. So we see that there is going to be a huge impact there. They're going to order less engines. We're going to you know, take less trips. But at the same time that we've seen, for example, airlines have a lot of difficulty, we've seen people that really win in this situation. Look at everything happening with e-commerce. The CEO of Shopify said, well, what we hoped and dreamed for for 2030 has been pulled into 2020. We started massively to go online, huge impact on logistics, winners and losers at the same time. But one thing is clear, it's faster than ever before. This uncertainty about the future might actually single some sort of a reset in some economies. Maybe also a reset in how we think about the future. But one thing is clear, we're going to have to brace ourselves for all these changes. How can we use them to our advantage? How can we become even stronger with all these changes? How can we become anti-fragile? And I refer to a book that Nassim Taleb wrote in 2008, The Last Financial Crisis. And in Anti-Fragile, he said, well, if you introduce too much stress into a system, then things actually will break. And that was a bank, for example, in 2008. Today, we see that, for example, because we don't travel, Hertz goes out of business. We see that the airlines are in trouble or the non-food retailers, which are struggling. A natural way to deal with that is to say, well, if we don't want to break, how can we become more resistant to change? How can we become more robust? And this is something that a lot of the banks did after 2008. They built in governance and rules and compliance, but they became robust, but they actually lost their agility. And that's not what we want. Maybe this pandemic has shown that we need to brace ourselves, but actually think about being adaptable and flexible and resilient. I love the analogy with the trees. The, the mighty oak tree could still fall and be toppled by a hurricane, but the willow is capable of bending. And if you want to put that in perspective, I think there is a clear difference between robustness, which is the ability to keep operating even things go really bad, but it's resilience that we need. It's the capability to bounce back and actually take advantage of these opportunities. So how can we build companies that are not just robust but resilient? maybe even get stronger as a result of all these changes. We've seen companies like Zoom, for example, take advantage of a pandemic. Actually, the FT made a roundup of the top 100 companies that prospered during the pandemic. And if you look at the top 15, well, they're all technology companies. I mean, most of them are US, some Chinese, one Canadian. But does it mean that a technology company is immune and anti-fragile? Not necessarily, but the big ones certainly were. If you look at the top technology companies, they're a great example of you know, these unicorns that we talked about um, at length in the last decade. But I think it's more than that. I think it's now the opportunity for traditional companies to reinvent themselves. Even some of the smaller unicorns are in trouble. But look at the unicorns. I mean, Amazon is a great example. They've single-handedly transformed the world of e-commerce and retail. We know that they prospered. They're probably one of the companies that really are the winners of the pandemic. But there's also the other side. Let me take you to Walmart, the biggest traditional retailer in the world. This is a company that yeah, was very disruptive in the last century, but now they're just a normal retailer. Well, what's normal? Two and a half million employees, one of the largest companies on the planet. And I love what they're doing because they are now innovating at scale as well. These are the pickup towers that are installed in Walmarts in the US, where if you buy something on the Walmart app, you can go to a Walmart, scan your app, and the package connected to the warehouse will be delivered to you in 10 seconds. That's a lot better than the old days when you would have to wait for some guy to find your parcel in the warehouse. If you don't have time to go to a Walmart, which was very popular during the pandemic, fine. You can order online on your app, 
Somebody from Walmart will come to your house and deliver the goods, can even unlock your smart door and then put the goods inside, or even if you allow them, they will stock your refrigerator with the things that you've purchased online. I love that. I love the idea that these things that I bought will still be fresh when I come home. But some people say, no, I don't want that. I want some strange human being in my house. Fine, we'll send a driverless car and a robot can deliver the same goods and position the same types of features and services. As a matter of fact, Walmart actually launched Walmart Plus, the answer to Amazon Prime, in full pandemic. For me, this is a great example of a traditional company reinventing itself. And I think this is, of course, more difficult than building something from scratch. But what does a phoenix have to do? In this roller coaster of seismic shocks and systemic shifts, what you need is a very good view on the future. You need to understand what is out there. This is one of my favorite movies. What you see here is New York in 1911. And in 1911, you know, this is the flat iron building. New York was all about horses and carriages. And then the very first automobile arrives onto the scene. What would your reaction have been if you saw that in 1911? Would you be excited? Would you be curious? Would you be angry? This man, Ed Klein, sold horses in New York, and he hated the automobile. As a matter of fact, he was so frustrated, he put this ad in the New York Times to convince people not to fall into the hype of the automobile. There's one conclusion, Ed Klein was an idiot. But if you were there in 1911 and you owned a stable, would you have turned your stable into a garage? Or would you have said, nah, I'm going to milk this horse business for as long as I can? So what is your lens onto the future? We're now seeing that customer behavior, consumers, have shifted as a result of digital becoming normal. And a lot of these new players have actually raised the Olympic minimum in terms of customer experience. This is what people expect now. They want to share their data if these companies can really do something, if these companies really show that they really know their customer. But the most important thing is to figure out how you can be essential for your customers and be relevant at the same time. And that is perfectly illustrated with the rise of platforms. Platforms are basically the new 21st century reality. They seem to attract users like magnets. But the reality is we actually, as consumers, we feed information to these platforms to make them richer. We feed the beast. I drove here this morning with Waze. I love Waze. And every time I use Waze, I give them, I gladly give them information. They get smarter and they give me value because I got here on time. We're feeding data and information to the beast. In the beginning, the beasts are nice and fluffy and wonderful, and then we feed it too much data, and then we think, oh, my god, this is pretty scary. But it is a new reality. This is maybe one of my favorite illustrations of that. What you see here is, in light blue, the total number of text messages of all the mobile operators on the planet. All the T-Mobiles, all the Vodafones. And in dark blue, the number of messages on WhatsApp. And in 2010, when the mobile operators were still printing money with SMS, they were raking in the cash, they had a really good ride. And if you ask them, what's going to happen next? What's the future? They said, oh, we hired a consulting agency, and they think this is going to happen. No, this happened. The reality is that the telecoms are now being reduced to what is known as a dumb pipe. They connect you, but they capture no value. And that is exactly that core question. A telco is still essential. You still need the SIM card, but their relevance has dropped. And I believe that in the never normal, we have to refocus our effort on becoming relevant. In a world which is moving so fast, what we need to do is look at what I call the day after tomorrow. How much time do you spend on today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow? What is today? It's the hundreds of emails. It's the dozens of Zoom calls that we're in. It eats up so much of our time. What's tomorrow? It's next year's budget. I love budget season. It's a yearly sarcastic ritual in which basically we put fake news into Excel that is consolidated into something that never works. I'm exaggerating, of course. But then there's the day after tomorrow. New ideas, new business models, new concepts that could change the rule of the game. How much time do we spend on today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow? Many people say 70, 20, 10. Reality is 93, 7, and 0. And the problem is value. Today is very important, tomorrow is very important, but the day after tomorrow is crucial if you want to reinvent yourself for the never normal. The problem is that's not the full model. 
actually there is an extra element and this big red square is what I call the shit of yesterday, which creates negative value. But think about this in your company. What is your balance of focusing on the day after tomorrow and the customer in the day after tomorrow and cleaning up the mess of the past? I think this is the time for reinvention. I think it's the time for seizing the opportunities that it gives. But you have to structure that. I became really um, intrigued by the model of the hourglass. You all know what an hourglass looks like. The top of the hourglass, this is the part of your organization that looks at the day after tomorrow, that senses all the opportunities, and then experiments and tries it because you need to figure out what is right for you. A wide lens and then the bottom of the hourglass is going to be the part where it falls in and then you scale those opportunities. But if you want the top of the hourglass, if you want to follow that never normal as an organization, you're going to need to be bold on your vision, but also flexible on the details. But once you've figured it out, once you've sensed and tried, then you can scale and run that. And I would argue that most companies today have a really good bottom part of the hourglass. They're really good at scaling and running, but what you need to do is really intensify your capabilities of sensing and trying. So what is the recipe for the future that you're building? I coined this into something which I call vaccine. And vaccine is an incorrectly spelled six-letter word, but the V is for velocity. I think you know, speed is more important than ever before. I, I love this quote from Mario Andretti. If everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. Probably a bad quote for a Formula One driver. But look at the hospital in Wuhan that was constructed in just 10 days. I mean, 10 days. When I saw that, you could see the speed of the never normal. I live in a country where we couldn't do that in 10 days. It would take us 10 months, maybe even 10 years. But it's not just speed, it's agility. I love the analogy of the white water kayaker. I mean, this seems like a really scary sport in the beginning. The water could crush you, you're submerged. But if you learn how to read the river, then you can actually use the power of change to your advantage. Look at what we saw in COVID, where, for example, a company like Lego used the same machines to make toys and turned them into machines to make visors for hospitals. It's unleashing the creative potential that is inside our organizations, and it's firing on all the innovation cylinders. It's product and market and service and model innovation. Look at a company like Disney. They had prepared Disney Plus, their platform strategy, Disney as a service, before COVID, well, the first six weeks, 50 million subscribers. Now they are seeing that digital only is their future. And we now see releases that are only going to be featured on Disney+. Plus. They're now reinventing themselves as a direct-to-consumer priority company. The last two are networking and experimentation. We don't live in the age of digital. We live in the age of networks. I recently did some work for, for example, a company like Baycart. They make steel wire. They sell a lot of that to companies like Bridgestone, who actually make tires, who sell it to BMW, and who is now trying to figure out what is going to be the post-pandemic way of actually selling cars. If you don't have the transparency and the trust in the network, you will never be able to achieve the results. We live in a world that is hyper-connected, but it takes a network to actually fight a network. We have to think like a network because the outside world is a network. The last one is experimentation. We need the psychological safety to take risks. I love this quote from Mandela. I never fail, I either win or I learn. And I believe that if companies want to leverage the never normal, if they really want to increase innovation, they are dramatically having to lower the cost of failure. So speed, agility, creativity, innovation, networking, and experimentation. I think this is a recipe for the never normal because we can't wait for the final Harvard Business Review to fall into our lap and implement the seven steps. That doesn't work anymore. This is no longer the age of lessons learned. This is the age of lessons learning. We will have to experiment and learn as we go along. The problem is we've built organizations for scalable efficiency. We have to rethink them for scalable learning. I think this is a mechanism to cope with this uncertainty, but I am a perennial optimist. I love what Rachel Botsman says about trust. Trust is the confident relationship with the unknown. I hope this hasn't depressed you, but inspired you. I'm an absolute optimist about this never normal. But if you look at your sector, I mean, the world of electricity has been pretty stable for a relatively long time. 
It's something that was all the hype more than 100 years ago, and now it is in a phase where I think it is ripe for fundamental change. This is the age where you can leverage the never normal, but you will have to turn it all the way to 11. We shouldn't be afraid of technology. I mean, we see that technology plays an ever-increasing role in our life. I think, on the contrary, we should really embrace it. I love this quote from Maya Angelou. If you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be. I can only wish you a lot of success in the never normal. Thank you.